Uh, we will have now Dennis Dolenz. Um, he's a PhD candidate in Edinburgh uh, University. And he's also teaching and lecturing in the Biodigital Architecture Master Degree at UIC, the University, the International University of Catalonia here in Barcelona. So thank you very much for being here and it's your turn. Thank you, Ignazi. Uh, could we have the slides, please? I don't think we can have a revolution and bring in innovation from nature under the conditions we've been educated under. I think we have to bring up a new generation who can do better than we've done. And um, I see this, and my research in Edinburgh is dealing with cognition and dealing with areas of the way we think, how we think, how we design. And the way that that is done is, in biomimetics, is making a connection through nature and through a process of understanding and observation. And the observation, of course, has traditionally been through our eyes and through our tactile systems and through our sensory abilities. And these are still primary and wonderful importance. And we need to teach how to hone those, how to use those very effectively. But we have new technologies. We have technologies that reach beyond our perceptions. And most of us today don't understand those technologies. And most of us today aren't able to even define what intelligence is. Because scientists can barely agree on what intelligence is. So if we're talking about having intelligent performance, in, in buildings or intelligent performance in mater new materials, we need to start defining some terms so that what I say has a meaning to what you understand or what you say has a meaning to what I understand. So what we need a common language for biomimetics. We need ways to define the architecture that is about to happen. And to do that, we need to be able to use science and we need to be able to really understand how to do that. But we're not biologists, so how do we do this? Uh. Okay, this isn't really working. I brought some, okay. We're seeing information in my my proposal to you is we need to begin to define information that works for us, that will work for children, and that will work for science. And so when we're looking at this, we're seeing performance. We're seeing performance in this seed pod and in this leaf that is falling every day. Millions of these fall in the streets of Barcelona. And they're genetically carrying on a long tradition of a biological life, although right now it's an animated life, it's in suspension, it isn't growing. This could maybe last for a thousand years if it's protected. And it's developed its own, through nature and through evolution, its own form that answers to a specific need. The need is to travel away from its parent. So. When you see it fall, you're seeing information. You're not only seeing biology, you're seeing the way information is taking place, the way information is performing. And even Gaudí's buildings do not perform in this way. Gaudí's buildings do not perform biologically. Biological buildings are the promise of new technologies. Biologies are the promise of ways to do new architecture. I think through many of the, the trails that Lynn was describing through the Da Vinci Fund. Ways of tracking, ways of thinking, ways of financing 
and ways of understanding. So once we start seeing that architects and designers have a, a different channel in the future, we also see there are ways to teach children. So we're looking between now our visions and the visions possible through technology. So while we're looking at a seed pod I just showed you and a, a leaf form, we could also look to electron scanning microscopes. We could look for inspiration in new ways of using technology, of introducing science as a way of introducing drawing, a way of introducing thinking, a way of introducing the, the performance of a city, the performance of a building. So the first thing to do to do that is how do we define data and information? In our research in Edinburgh, we're defining data as everything, this, this nonlinear source of just bombardment. It's, it's what hits us. It's what we know is, you know, it's coming in through all of our per perceptual and all of our performative uh, kind of processes of, of receiving. Information is what we do with it, how we use that data. So it's a translation process. So architecture is a translation of data to information. So what I'm suggesting is that we start re-looking at many of the trails that have been provided to us by designers such as Gaudi, and we start using electronic simulations, we start using digital technologies, we start thinking about performative design through simulation, using computational simulation for the way leaves behave, the way they perform, what they can do. And in this, <clears throat> it starts involving the designer in primary research and the designer in material development. So you start seeing design crossing over into economic fields. And you start seeing design moving where these sort of performances are issues of biorobotics. And biorobotics are a very specialized field. That when you look at some of the areas that say on the, the railings of Casabacho or the railings of Casamila, you start seeing these forms that look like moving seas or these shade patterns or these sort of luminescences that, that shimmer up the, the facade of the building. These could be taken in a different kind of manner. We could reinterpret this sort of thing. This is a building that I've been working on for a while. It's a biorobotic building. It's based on leaf performance and not just leaf performance in the sense of a um, photosynthesis, but leaf performance in the sense of intelligence. How do we define intelligence now? Do we want an intelligent building? I think we do. But we don't want to say it's a conscious building. We don't want to say we want a building that's thinking like us. We want a building that's thinking like nature. Because if we build a building that's thinking like us, it will do away with us. It just doesn't. OK, so these are, this, these are some of the processes. I won't take you through it very, very, very fully today. The, the computation at the bottom is for leaf forms and their performances and their interlocking for shade, for opening for light, for the integration of bi biological materials such as, as algae or bacteria. Bacteria is one of the most interesting forms of ways of, say, performative information now is being channeled through biological research for new, perhaps in, in Lin, Lin's sense again, the breakthrough technology will be biological chips that transform our cell phones into living forms and let them self-produce their own power and channeling and a lot of the computation abilities. And these are things that are in research now. It's not, these are not my science, science fiction wishes. So the, the bottom line is on this, this image is the sim, simulation through computation based in heritage through plant simulation and biorobotics. Ways of starting to use other, other forms from the leaf for materialization, actually starting to think of laminas, ways of performance, how do we translate those things into materials, how do we use 
the cell phone and apps in the field for sketching, for ideas, for documentation, for these sort of ways of doing design and ways of learning. This is a handbook for, for master's students, but it works very well for primary students as well. Um, there's a whole series. These, these, this whole handbook is available free online. It's being used in many, many different classes. It, it shows ways of doing research that can be modeled for other forms, not ways to just make these. I really think we have a... Um, so, in those ways of performing and those ways of thinking or, or teaching, you can, you can just hit me if I'm going too long. Um, these are, these are some of the early experiments in, from a class here in Barcelona. Ways of taking a leaf form and thinking about how they could interact. But thinking about what would be the connection of the technology. What's interesting here is we look at it and think, oh, it looks like they just put some stitches in it. But they actually did research from the way birds put linkages together. And this is a class Ignazi and I did a couple of years ago at LA Zaba. And that starts giving a way and a means of that the first step before digitalization is starting to work with tactileness, to keep your senses going, to understand, to do research in the field, to, to start looking at ways nature performs and how we might build a wall. So this is a very beginning, uh, this is a first step, that's like the first week for this student. Here's another student in the same process using parts of a palm tree to reshape what will be a very, very slick building eventually how to use grass blades and start. So what it starts beginning to, to, to organize is a way of doing research. So if we're talking about ways of thinking and ways of learning, we're talking about ways of looking and then ways of doing something with the material that we've looked at and then ways of finding other areas and access through research. Some of the means, that we're, the ways we're doing this is it's highly technical through using apps, but apps that are easily available, drawing apps. Um, there are a lot of new, there's a whole new area of TouchCAD that's just, just emerging. It really makes a very strong connection to the things Lynn was saying with 3D printing because you can now, Adobe and um, 3D systems have both released apps and new STL machines that students can start to fabricate from their ideas. They can start to do things on cell phones and tablets. And we know in third world situations and in many of our own first world countries that we have educational, very deep educational problems. We particularly have them in the United States. And we need means of educating beyond um, traditional classrooms. And I see that coming through mobility, through e-learning, through m-learning, and advanced uses of tablets and advanced communication and ways of doing research and ways of using social media that has, that have, has not been channeled into research. So we have a whole generation of students who know social media, but the schools don't know social media. And we have a whole generation of students that know how to do apps better than we could ever possibly do. And they can play games. Gamification in terms of industrial and um, in terms of economic development is like on a, a, a trajectory that goes from here to here in, before the year two, 2020. So we're seeing this sort of educational possibility that starts providing ways of thinking and ways of teaching. We start having the ability to integrate into our own, our own school systems ways that we would like our industry, ideas we would like our, our technology to do in the future. And they're not even very expensive ways. Um, I thought it was ironic that the uh, economic indicators we were looking at and the, the, the social um, kind of surveys that Lynn has been doing for economics, it, it was named the Da Vinci Fund. I have recently been um, studying Da Vinci anatomy. These are drawings from 1500. This is 1510 to 1513. Leonardo dissected, of course this was illegal, 
the full bodies for over a period of about 20 years, and he has a, a few hundred drawings, and most of them are owned by the Royal Collection in the United Kingdom, and there was recently a large show, there, it's just closed in Edinburgh at the Queen's Gallery, of the anatomical drawings of Leonardo da Vinci, and they were paired with technology. What we're seeing here is a torso of a woman. It's, it's very formalized and very, it's far, far too symmetrical. But Leonardo got many, many things, particularly about hearts, human hearts and the flow of blood. And he got many, many things correct. Many things. They weren't rediscovered for another 300 years, or it, really even longer. So we see this sort of technology that got closed off this view to science that would have probably changed Western culture had it been general. But the drawings were never f formally published until the 19th century. So we were looking at these drawings and Gregory Gibbons at the University of Warwick has done a project where they've used Leonardo's input and started looking at these drawings, how we would do these drawings today, how we would look to information as opposed to data, and this is an MRI scan to use technological scans to do 3D printing. And I was taken with this, and I w I'm introducing it into studios in the form of biological production in 3D materialization. So this is an MRI scan. Of course, you need to make a, a stereolithography model. You need thousands of individual scans. Like this, you know. But it's been done. The, the CAT scans have been translated to 3D, 3D systems and stereolithography um, file formats and printed. This is a human heart. It's in 3D form. The walls are very, very, very thin and quite delicate. It has all of the chambers and it's printed on a machine. It's a non-toxic resin, and what I'm proposing to you is the intelligence of architecture needs to be coming through this system. That we need to be, I think Gaudi today would be designing, still using catenary arches and, and calculations, this is still a very, very fine system, but he would be using advanced, all indications are that from Gaudi's studio, he would use whatever is available. He used photography, he used, reverse photography, he did models in from photographs and then he did drawings. You know, you sometimes think, gosh, you cheated. You know, he took photographs, he turned them upside down and then he did the drawings of the cathedral. And um, so we, saw, we see this kind of technology and advanced technology because it was photography in Gaudi's work. And, and so you research this and you see it and you think, well, maybe today he would model like this. Jujol was, was a modeler for him. Jujol made many of his, his things, fabricated things for him, visualized things. So I think this is a trail. The idea of intelligence in architecture, my message is that architecture needs to be rethought. Architecture as biomimetic includes intelligence because it includes performance of us. We are intelligent beings in intelligent nature. If we make dumb buildings, it's only because we're not thinking very well. We can make better models for ourselves. We can make better goals. We could use teaching through the internet. This is the open worm. This is synthetic biology. This is a vastly, vastly new, new area of research, but problems that have not been addressed and it's taken years in science to, to understand have in certain cases from the University of Washington, as soon as they made them open source and, and started getting citizen science working, they, start, they got answers that were not av available through ch standard channels of thinking in scientific publications and academia. Here, the, worm, the worm's body is built with a CAD system so I think this is a kind of a biology of architecture. All of, all of us who are interested in design sort of could see this as this could be a building. These are the organs of the worm, and they're proposing now that they synthesize 
the whole genome of the worm, and this will be one of the first living organisms on the internet. If not the very first. There are synthetic forms of life, even though we don't very often credit them. Um, and if you think of like Google's, um, the, the vehicles, the, the, the cars going down the street all over the world, taking driverless cars now going all over the United States, taking their pictures, and we have robotic cars that are perform performing on the streets. 20 years ago, we would have said that's science fiction. 50 years ago, we would have said they were intelligent. Today, we're just saying, oh, look, it, there's a car, and it's driving itself. But we're not saying that that's intelligent. We're making mistakes. So here, here is intelligence. It's performance. It's what we can see, we can trail. Ignazi and I built a bridge based on this. Here's the bridge. It's based on the, the flight patterns from seeds and their various forms put together as, an, as a structural truss. This was the, the, a bridge for the Pyrenees. It went into manu near to manufacturing before it was canceled. <laughs> um, this same information is still valuable. It's easy to teach this information. It's not hard. You don't have to be a scientist. You don't have to be a programmer. This is recent, using the same information. This is, OK, this was the information from the bridge. Using the same information, I made this bridge. This is the, the Union Canal in Edinburgh. And this is an NSTL model that has been placed that would be a small footbridge in Edinburgh. This is my last slide, I think, to show you tonight, today. It is a simulation of a tree. The only reason I don't claim this is as alive is because at the time I built it, there was no possibility of doing a biological STL material. There is today. New materials can be living materials through STL performance. So this is a perfectly synthesized tree that I have taken and as you would do with bonsai, is change it. So I'm not saying we should do this to trees in nature. I'm saying we should do this to trees we need to be columns because they're lightweight, they're flexible, they'll stand up to earthquakes, they'll stand up to tornadoes. You know, if you think that nature is nice or you think that nature is calm, you're making a very big mistake. Nature is mean. Just ask the people in the Philippines and um, that as much as we celebrate and find beauty in it, there is, there's tragedy. We need better performance. We need to look at nature's own secrets to get better performance for, for what we construct. This was a research I did on Zhuzhou. It was, this is um, almost 20 years ago. And it was when I was involved with, with, with Gaudi research here in Barcelona. So I brought this as an homage to, to, to the, the, the conference and to thank Danielle and Ignazi and to thank you. Thank you very much, Denise. I would like to, to ask you one question. Do you think that can we think in biometrics now as a major trend because new technology and because new computation abilities or possibilities? No. I think we need to prepare better. I think the foundation is necessary. I think education is, is the call. I think research is. I, when Lynn was pre presenting the statistics, and statistics have existed now through the Da Vinci Fund, it's the first series of statistics I've ever seen like this. And it is on. And, it's, and they're, they're from 2000. This is, a, this is a start. This is the beginning. The, the, that we're not at biomimetics yet. I think biomimetics is the goal. So I think we're on a track for it. I think the foundation is, is very well set or potentially set. But we're not educating children for this. And, um, you know, we're still educating children like, oh, isn't nature beautiful? And that's it. And, you know, it's, isn't it amazing? And everybody goes away saying it's amazing. But it's, it's a whole lot more. Thank you.